He should be number one in every area of our lives. That's what it's all about. Please open your Bibles to the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10. This morning we're going to continue our study in the Gospel of Matthew. Last week, uh, some of the things we looked at last week were very important in the uh, teachings that Jesus was giving to his disciples. And uh, you remember by this time he has already chosen the twelve. And he's beginning to work with them and mentor them as he moves forward in his ministry. But even as he taught, we know that there were multitudes of people that surrounded him to listen to him. You know, these days you hear about people teaching or preaching or whatever, and some people run the other direction. They don't want anything to do with it. But you know, Jesus, Jesus had a way of drawing people in. And I think it was just that love that he had for people. You know, he wasn't one who condemned the people. He loved them. He saw them at the point of their need. And you know, the Bible tells us that he's the same yesterday and today and forever. He never changes. So even this morning, he's looking down upon us with that same kind of love that he had for these people that he was speaking to here in our text now, we like the warm and fuzzy stuff. I know that's it, the feel-good stuff is really neat. But there are some things in the message also that are kind of tough. You know, we're, we are called children of God. And, and John tells us that what a blessing. Behold what manner of love the Father's given to us that we might be called the children of God. And when you think of yourself as a child of God, don't think of yourself as a helpless little child. You carry the power of the creator of the universe within you. So we're not like regular little children in the world. We are God's children. But yet at the same time, he wants to equip us. He wants to empower us. He wants to give us tools so that we can navigate our way through life. And truly, we need to be led in the way that we should go. There are so many paths that you can choose from, such a variety of paths that you can look at and say, well, I want to try this one for a while. And those of you who may have done that in your lives, you realize very quickly that a lot of those paths have dead ends. A lot of those paths have a sad ending to them. A lot of those paths lead to emptiness and desolation. And it might be something that you look at and say, well, this is a good thing. I'm going to have a career, and I'm going to devote my life to this career. But if that career comes above your relationship with Jesus, then it's not a good thing. Amen? You agree? He should be number one in every area of our lives. That's what it's all about. And in order for him to be number one, especially, oh, let me clue you in on something. You may not know this, but you're not going to win a popularity contest out there because you're a believer in Jesus Christ, okay? As a matter of fact, we're the minority. As a matter of fact, more than, maybe more than in recent memory, you're under attack because of what you believe. You're thought of as a lesser person because you are a believer in Jesus Christ, so it's not as though we're parading ourselves around and everybody's cheering for us as we go. It's a battle. It can be a struggle. And so how can little children win such a struggle? Well, we're little children in our hearts as we look at our Father and we say, Father, I know that you're going to provide for me. You're going to take care of me. You're going to see me through. But you know what else? I'm also going to stand as a soldier for the Lord. I'm going to be strong for Jesus. 
I'm not going to deny him. I'm not going to let peer pressure push him out of my life just because I want to have the uh, praise of men. I would much rather have the praise of God than the praise of men, right? But that can be tough sometimes. And if you don't know this, you can't do it on your own. You can't do it alone. You can't go out there and just say, well, I'm just going to be kind of a lone wolf, and I'm just going to, you know, who needs church? There's just a bunch of hypocrites there anyway, right? I'll just go out in the woods and worship God in my own little way. Let me tell you something. That does not work. That is not the way God designed. I'll just stay home and watch it on TV. Well, you know what? That might be keeping you in touch with what's going on, but you're not being fed in the same way you would be when you are here present with God's people. And God wants to equip you and me. He wants to give us the tools that we need in order to function, not only just survive, but to have victory in our lives. So the text we're going to look at this morning, in some ways, may appear a little bit harsh, Um, But this is when you're really getting down to brass tacks here. So I want to pick up our study in chapter 10, verse 26. And I'm going to go ahead and read down through the uh, remainder of this chapter. You can follow with me. He says, Therefore, do not fear them, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak it in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. But every very hair on your head is numbered. Do not fear, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father, who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father, who is in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and he who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. He who loses his life for my sake will find it. He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward, and he who receives a righteous man In the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, surely I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. So there's a lot of stuff here, isn't there? There's a lot of meat to what we just got done reading. One of the things that stands out is this is very, very personal. Jesus is pointing right at us as he's speaking these things. He's speaking directly to you and me. Now, I know you see the word him in there. You don't see the word her. But when you read the word him, you can include hers too. This is for all of us, okay? Sometimes people read that and they go, oh, well, that's just for men. No, it's for all of us. The same principles apply whether you're male or female. It's all the same. Amen? Yeah. Uh, And, yeah, I'm not going to go further with that. (laughs) So one of the things that we see in our passage here this morning is a phrase that Jesus uses a lot. 
It's a phrase that you can read throughout the whole Bible. As a matter of fact, it's a phrase that you can find about 360 different times in God's word. Don't be afraid. Fear not. I love that. Because, you know, there's 360 odd days in a year, and I think I need to be reminded of that every single day of the year, don't you? I'm thankful that the Lord put it in there that many times. One for every day. Don't be afraid. Fear not, I'm with you. Fear not, I will go before you in all things. Fear not, I have a plan for your life. And don't be afraid of people who oppress you. Or persecute you. The Lord wants his disciples to know that they can trust him. That we can trust him in any circumstance that might be going on in our lives. And you know, contrary to some people's attitude or beliefs, just because you've become a Christian doesn't make you immune to the difficulties of life. How many of you know that to be true, right? And perhaps maybe... Sometimes when we become Christians, life can maybe get even a little bit tougher for us because we're Christians. Because, you know, we just don't fit into the mold anymore. And the world doesn't like that. The world wants to squeeze you in. You know, in the book of Romans, it talks about being conformed to the world. He says, don't be conformed to the world like a piece of clay that the world is molding into its own image. That's what the world wants to do with us. And you look out there and you see what kind of images are being molded out there and you think, oh my gosh, I don't want that to be me. And so Paul tells us in Romans, don't be molded into the way of the world. Don't be conformed into the things of the world, but he says, be transformed. Be changed be transformed into the image of Christ. And I got to share this because it's so beautiful. If you go walk in my office, I have these moths and butterflies in a case, and, and they're real, but they're all in a case. But I love those butterflies, and I love those moths because they represent life. They represent resurrection. A caterpillar goes through a process that they still can't figure out. It's called metamorphosis. And you see that little caterpillar going along, eating the leaves and stuff like that, and he builds this little cocoon around him. You know that the inside of that caterpillar becomes nothing but mush when he's in there? It just turns into like a liquid, and then it's transformed. It's metamorphosized into a brand new creature. And it, and it, it, it exits that cocoon as a butterfly. It can do things that the caterpillar could never do. It has different dietary desires. It has a whole new purpose. That's what resurrection is, you guys. That's what it means to come to the Lord and allow him and say, Lord, I want to be changed. I want to come out of that cocoon. I want to fly, and I want to be with you. Beautiful. I love that picture that God gives us through the creation of the things that he created on this world. But yes, you and I, we will be encompassed at times with trouble, tribulation, persecution. But Jesus is telling us this morning, don't be afraid of that. And contrary to some thought, just because you're going through hard times doesn't mean God's mad at you. Just because things aren't going the way you might have planned for them to go God's not mad at you. Just because you lose a loved one way too soon, it doesn't mean God's mad at you or the loved one. That's just part of life. We go through hard times. God loves us so much that he was willing to send his son to die on a cross. A horrible, ugly death. And by his grace now, we can sit here together and we can say, oh, man, I don't have any fear. I can't help but think about how Peter felt when he stepped out of that boat, the moment he stepped out of that boat. And he had his eyes on the Lord, fixed upon the Lord. 
And it didn't matter what kind of turmoil was going on around him. He kept his eyes on the prize. And that man, Peter, actually walked on the water in the midst of the storm. But Peter did what we maybe do many times in our lives too. He took his eyes off the prize. He started looking around. He started seeing the waves and the wind and the threat of drowning, and he began to sink. And you know, Jesus very well could have said, you know, Peter, I gave you a shot at this, and you failed, so how long can you hold your breath? Right? I'll see you later, Pete. You're on your own. No, he didn't do that. What did Peter do? Peter said, save me. Save me, Lord. And he reached down, and he pulled him back up out of there. That's, that's exactly what he's talking about in our text today. He's going to be our strength. He's going to be our salvation. He wants to be our lifeline. So do not be afraid. We've seen it over and over again. We might encounter legal problems, family problems, slander, because we identify with Jesus Christ. Now that word identify... It's really being thrown around in our culture these days, isn't it? Does anybody know what a fuzzy is? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for correcting me. It's a furry. Who said that? <laughs> oh, Glenn knows. <laughs> Have you guys heard of that furry thing? I got to tell you, if you don't know about it, this, this will blow your mind, Okay. Everything's about how you identify yourself today. You identify as a woman, a man, maybe even an animal. You could dress up in a little onesie kitty cat suit with a tail and a nose and whiskers and ears, and you can go to school, and you can tell everybody, today I identify as a cat. <laughs> now, we're laughing, but this is tragic and, and here's, here's even something that's even more tragic. The schools are putting litter boxes in the bathroom so that the kitties can use the litter box. What is going on? This is insane. I know. Everybody's like, are you kidding me? No, I'm not kidding you. I thought it was a joke when I first heard it because I thought, how could people be so ignorant well, I shouldn't use that word, I suppose. How about deceived, lost? So we live in a world where there's a lot of confusion. So I want to say this morning, I identify with Jesus Christ. I identify as being a born-again believer, saved by the blood of Christ with a reservation in heaven. That's how I identify this morning and tomorrow morning and the morning after that until I take my last breath. Isn't it amazing how the world can take a term like that and just totally pervert it? We take the precious holy, they take the precious holy things of God and they, pollute, they pervert it and pollute it. So the Lord is saying to us this morning, man, you guys are going to be up against it at times. It's not always going to be easy. It's not always going to be a cakewalk. There are going to be struggles and you're going to experience heartache. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians concerning the way we treat this environment that we live in. Paul said, therefore, do not judge anything before the appointed time. We read in the Sermon on the Mount, do not judge, because that's not our job to judge. A judge has the authority to condemn. We don't have that authority. Only God has that authority, right? So that's why Jesus says, do not judge, because you're not the judge. But there is a judge, so don't judge anything before the appointed time. And when should it be judged? Paul said, when the Lord comes. That's when it'll happen. He will bring to light what is hidden in the darkness, and he will expose the motives of men's hearts. You know, we can do a real good job of hiding our motives. We can put on that little costume. We can put on our little churchianity faces and come in here and smile and hug and, you know, but really inside of our hearts, there's bitterness, there's unforgiveness. But we can bury that. We can hide it from people. 
But you know what? It's still there. And it's still devastating to us when we hold on to it like that. Jesus said in verse 27, I'm going to tell you, whatever I tell you in the dark, speak it in the light. And whatever you hear in the ear, preach it on the housetop. Adam Clark, in his commentary, wrote about this concerning this passage. He said that the, the law in Hebrew, all, uh, the, whoever explained, if there was a priest explaining the Hebrew law, because they spoke Latin and uh, Greek and different, you know, it wasn't just Hebrew in that culture. So there was an interpreter standing there next to him. And, and the rabbi would, would lean over and whisper into the ear of the interpreter, and then the interpreter would proclaim what is being said. And that was the custom of the time. So that's why we see Jesus saying here that if you, if you find do, whatever is whispered in your ear, proclaim it by God. Be the one who puts it out there concerning the things of the Lord. And some of you might say, well, you know, Pastor, I really don't have a a lot of Bible knowledge. I'm, I'm not real smart when it comes to, you know, Scripture. i got to go to the table of context just to find Genesis sometimes, you know. That's okay. Because, you know, when we start out, we, we start out that way. But as we learn and as we grow and we, as we study the Bible like we do in this church every Sunday, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, God's Word opens up to us. We become students of the Word. That's my goal as a pastor for you, to be a student of the Word, so that everyone that comes up to you, you might have an answer to give to them when they ask you, how is it that you go through things and you still seem to have a sense of peace and a positive attitude? And we have an opportunity at that moment to share with them. Oh, it doesn't have to be a 40-minute dissertation, and it doesn't have to be quoting five chapters of Scripture. Sometimes... The best thing that you have to share is your story. Sometimes the best thing you have to share is your testimony. To say, you know, I was lost, and now I'm found, and this is how it happened. It's so important that we proclaim the news. And as the Holy Spirit is whispering things in our ear, God wants us to send it out for others to hear. So important for us to do this. Now, verse 28 says, Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Wow, back in the time of Christ, thousands and thousands and thousands of Christians were killed, murdered, crucified, beheaded, tortured, eaten by wild animals, Starved to death. They met horrible endings. A few weeks ago, I think I read to you about what happened to the 12 apostles and how their lives ended. And not one of them ended well. Not one. When you start talking about this idea, because now I'm a child of the king and I deserve nothing but prosperity, you're walking down a bad path. I don't see one apostle... I don't see one church father in history who wound up driving the nicest cars and having the nicest suits and the nicest everything. No, most of them lived in poverty. Most of them suffered persecution. Most of them died horrible deaths for the Lord, for what they believed in. I look at my life sometimes and I think, man, you are so soft. You are such a sissy when it comes to that stuff. Will you truly be able to stand when that kind of fire heats up in your life? And some of you have, and you've experienced that. And here's the thing about fire. When God lights that fire in our lives, you know what? It cooks out those impurities that are in our lives. That's what it's meant to do. It's not meant to destroy us. It's meant to purify us. It's meant to cook all the dross out of my life. That's how the people that work with metal did it back in that day. They would pour the metal, the gold, or the silver into a, a container and heat it up. And any of the impurities that weren't gold or silver would rise to the surface. They call it dross. 
And they would take a little stick and they would wipe the dross off the surface. And they would look down into the metal. And if they could see the reflection clearer, they would think that it's purified. But if it was fuzzy or not able to be understood, they'd heat it up again. And they'd cook that dross out again. And after a few times of that happening, the person that's cooking the metal would be able to look down in that container and see his reflection like looking in a mirror. And he would know that metal is pure. This is what God wants to do in our lives. He wants to look at you as that container and see his reflection in your life. But there are times when all of us, I believe, experience this turning up the heat in our lives. Have you ever prayed and asked God to turn up the heat in your life? Not many of us do, do we? As a matter of fact, some of us, most of us, maybe all of us, we kind of get, we don't want that. Don't, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't want that, Lord. But isn't that really an awesome prayer to pray? Isn't that a great prayer of faith to say, you know what, Lord, I know there's some things in me that don't please you, so I'm submitting myself. Turn that heat up in my life, Lord. Cook that stuff out of me. I want to be pure. I want to have a reflection of who you are to the world. And that's what it takes in order to do that. And here's another thing. We should only preach, teach, share what we have learned from the Lord. We shouldn't be making it up as we go. We shouldn't pander to people's opinions because everybody has one. And we should say to ourselves, you know what, if the Bible doesn't teach it, I'm not going to teach it. I want to stick to God's word. There's safety in God's word. It keeps me on track. It's so easy to get off on these little ramps, you know. Well, not if we keep our face in the Word. It doesn't do that. And you know, if you've been here very long, that's our commitment here. To teach from the Bible God's Word as a guide for our lives. And the beautiful thing about this guide that we have right here, it never changes. It's the same guidelines 2,000 years ago that it is today and that will be 2,000 years from now. It doesn't change. It's fixed. It's like a law of nature. You cannot change it. It's a spiritual law in a sense. I can fight gravity all I want, but I guarantee you every time I'm going to lose. No matter how hard I want to pretend that gravity is not real. It's the same thing with God's word. We want to be committed to his word and the values and the morals that God's word gives to us to live our lives. I love it because God's word gives us tools for right now in this moment and tools for when we walk out the door and tools for when we're being blessed and tools for when we're going through hardship and he gives us tools for that moment and that day when you take your last breath. He's given us everything that we need to live godly lives. All we need to do is grab a hold of it. Don't fear those who can kill your body. Fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Who is him? Well, in my Bible, him is capitalized, H, him. It's talking about God. Fear him. Have respect for him. Have honor for him. You know, there are people who go and stand in front of a judge. You can go into a courtroom right down here and stand in a courtroom. Maybe you were speeding or maybe you got some kind of crime and you got arrested and you're standing in front of a judge and it's a 78-year-old woman who weighs about 90 pounds. Not very scary looking until you get in front of her and she's got that robe on. If you saw her on the street, you would think, oh, that's not a threat. Well, you walk in that courtroom, and you're standing in front of that person, and that person has all the authority to remove freedom from you, you get a healthy respect for that old gal, don't you? That's the kind of thing we're looking at with the Lord. When I stand before God, I am in awe of his wonder, his power, his righteousness, and then I look at me and I see how much I lack. 
and how short I come. And yeah, sometimes our little kneecaps tremble because God is awesome, holy, never change. And we stand before him with that type of respect. Verse 29, our two sparrows sold for a copper coin and not one of them falls to ground apart from your father's will. But every hair on your head <laughs> is numbered. Well, I got to say this because I love it because that job for some people for God is real easy to do. There's not many hairs left. He can number them pretty single digits maybe sometimes. I don't know. But what is he trying to tell us here? He's trying to tell us that even the most insignificant ones God cares about. The sparrow. A sparrow was nothing. It, 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 was a, it was something that they could buy as, purchase as a sacrifice when they couldn't afford a lamb or something else, and they could buy a little sparrow. And it was the cheapest thing you could purchase. One little tiny copper coin. A penny, maybe. But it says, you know what? Not one of them falls to the ground without God knowing about it. And I like that he doesn't use the word God. He used Father. Without Father knowing about it. The very hairs on your head are numbered. God knows everything about you inside and out, before and after. You're transparent before him. We are. We can't hide anything. So don't fear, verse 31, because you are of more value than many sparrows. I think having a sense of value in life is really important. I'm not talking about a false sense of pride. I'm not talking about arrogance. I'm talking about a value that, that God sees towards us. If you weren't valuable in God's eyes, why would he send his son to die for you? Is there something that God sees in us that perhaps we don't see in ourselves sometimes? Have you ever looked in the mirror and said, I don't like what I see? You're a loser kind of a thing? No, God doesn't see us that way. He sees you as valuable. Therefore, verse 32, whoever confesses me before men, I will confess him before my Father who is in heaven. That's a very positive, positive thing. How do I confess him before men? Well, we'll look at that in just a second. Whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. I don't see any middle ground there, do you? I don't see any gray area between verse 32 and verse 33. I think it's light and dark. I think it's cut and dry. You either confess him or you deny him. There's no fence walking here. I confess him. How do I confess him? Well, first I start off by confessing him with my mouth. I confess that he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings, that he died for my sins. And I want him to come into my life, and I want him to be my, 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 my Savior and my Messiah. That's what I desire, God. And so we come before him with that kind of a heart, and he honors it. Yes, it's important for us to confess our faith verbally. But is that the end of it? If you march down the aisle and you kneel before the altar and you pray the sinner's prayer and you walk out the door, you're good to go for the rest of your life just to go on living the way you were living before, you know, because actually yeah, I said the prayer. I made the confession. I must have my fire insurance all paid up. I'm good to go. No, that's not what he's talking about. It is a beginning. It is a beginning. But there's so much more to it, isn't there? We confess the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives every single day when we're alive. How we live our lives, how we treat people, what our heart is like towards those who don't know the Lord, and what our heart is like towards those who do, those who are family members in the family of Christ. Paul said in Romans not, chapter 10, he said, if you confess... Uh, um, he said, I'll read it, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you'll be saved. 
Ah, but I didn't give you the whole scripture. I only gave you a part of it. Confessing with our mouth. God wants to hear from you. That's why it's so important when we pray. You pray with your mouth. Well, I just think it all in my brain. God reads my mind. I don't have to say anything. No, he wants to hear from us. You know, it blesses him. It's the fruit of our lips. When we worship him here on Sunday morning, he's blessed by that. What if you all just sat here and worship him in your thoughts while the music's playing? And you're all kind of kumbaya, you know, but no sound. Seems like it'd be kind of foolish and kind of a waste of time because God wants to hear from us. He wants to have a dialogue with us, not just a monologue. That's what intimacy is all about. First of all, we confess him with our mouth. And secondly, we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Now, let me just back up a little bit. It's real easy to say Jesus is Lord. It's homogenized. It's been said so many times that people don't even know what they're saying when they say it. But when we say that, when we confess that, you know what we're saying? We're saying that Yeshua is my Messiah. That's what we're saying. We're saying God is my Savior. That's what you're saying. People don't know that. People just think it's a title. Jesus is the Lord. Well, yeah, it's a title. But when I confess that with my mouth, do I really know what I'm saying and what I'm confessing? He is the only true God. He is the creator of the universe. He is the one who died for me on the cross. He is Yeshua. Jehovah. Hamashiach, my Savior, my Lord. then you'll be saved. He goes on to say, because it's with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. So I confess with my mouth, and then with my heart, I go out there and I live it. That's the second part that some may forget about in this process. And there's something really important. We can confess Or we can deny Jesus by the way we live our lives. That's so important. If we say we are Christians but we live like the world, the Bible tells us we're in darkness. The Bible tells us that we're lying to ourselves and we're lying to God. And no liar has any place in heaven. It's very possible that maybe someone's in here this morning and they're going, oh my gosh, that's me. I'm kind of one way in church, and I'm a totally different way when I'm outside the church. I have, like, diarrhea of the mouth when I'm outside the church, but when I'm in here, it's all good stuff, right? That's a kingdom divided against itself. That kingdom cannot stand. Yes, that's a spiritual principle, but it's also a principle of reality that we're seeing happen even in our own country around us today. It's a kingdom divided against itself. And if it doesn't change, it won't stand. Not good news there, but very true. He says something here pretty shocking um, in verse 34. He says, don't think that I've come to bring peace on the earth. I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. Wait a minute. Just a few chapters ago, he said, my peace I give to you. Not as the world can give, but my peace I give to you. And now he's saying, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. Because I have come, and this is what happens, and maybe you are sitting here this morning, and you've experienced this. I know a lot of you who have experienced this. Maybe all of us at some point. I have come to set a man against his father. A daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be those of his own household. Why? Because I've given my life to Jesus. I've become one of his children. He who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Wow. What's he saying? 
He's saying, I have to be at the top rung of your life. I have to be on the altar of your life. If there's anything else there beside me, then it's mixed up, it's inappropriate, it's not authentic. You're kidding yourself. And let me tell you, Jesus is not going to share that throne with anything or anybody else either. It has to be exclusively him and him alone. In verse 38, he who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Take up my cross? We have a brother here in the church that carves these awesome little crosses out of wood by hand. Some of you have them around your neck right now. It's a great, beautiful thing to do for people. But that's not what Jesus is talking about here. He's not talking about taking up your cross and putting that necklace on around your neck and wearing it as a piece of jewelry. The cross is an implement of death. The cross is a tool of execution. You know, these days we like to put needles in people and inject them with poison and kill them. Lethal injection. So what if Jesus was around today and that's how they executed him with lethal injection? We'd all be walking around with little syringes around our necks? No, absolutely not. When he says, take up the cross and follow me, he's saying, you've got to die to yourself. You have to deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me, he said. Self has to be down here. And that even means in the midst of turmoil and hardship. In verse 39, he who finds his life will lose it. I went to school for 935 years to get this degree, and now I am all that. I've got everything I want. You know, I had a really good friend that, um, well, an acquaintance, I should say. For years and years, this guy wanted to be the champion skateboarder of the world. He was a surfer and skateboarding really good. You know, you see these kids out in these skateboard parks and stuff. And he got good enough to enter contests. And pretty soon he was traveling all around the world with a group of men, boy, young men, and they were having competitions on these skateboards, and one day he won the world championship. And he was given a trophy, and he was given accolades, and he was in every surfer skateboard magazine you could imagine. And six months later, he was drunk on his face and alone and had no hope. Because what he longed for, what he worked for, the thing that he put on the top of his rung was having glory given to himself. And it faded so quickly. Now there's a good end to that story because he did come back. He did realize what was going on and, and now he's pastoring a church and loving the Lord. And he's got that testimony to share with people who have that same kind of difficulties. The glory, the things of the world will not satisfy us. Well, if we think we've found our life, we've really lost it. It's when I'm willing to say, I'm going to lay it all down for you, Jesus. He who loses his life for my sake, whether I'm still walking around and breathing or whether I'm, my life is taken, he says, you will find life. You'll find a life that they can't take. And he who receives you, this is cool, he who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. Your ambassadors, your little moons, your little reflections of God, wherever you go, the full moon, the light of the moon, it doesn't make its own light. It's a reflection of the sun. And Jesus is saying, man, if you're a little moon going around and illuminating people's lives, then you're representing me. And if you're representing me, you're representing the one who sent me. What an awesome honor that is. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. You ever had anybody prophesy over you? It's kind of a strange experience, actually. I had somebody prophesy over me when I was just a kid. And I walked away shaking my head. I was embarrassed. I felt like, what a weird person that was. How could she say such things to me? And it wasn't good news. 
Basically, she told me, your life is going to be a struggle. You're going to have a hard time. But you know what? In the end, God's going to call you, and he's going to raise you up, and he's going to use you in a mighty way. And I thought, wait a minute. I don't want to struggle. I don't want to go through all that stuff. And it wasn't until after I actually started walking with the Lord again, it wasn't until actually we actually started this ministry that those words came back to me, and the Holy Spirit gave them back to me. He said, it came to pass, didn't it? Those who receive a prophet receive, in the name of a prophet, receive a prophet's reward. Prophecy is very important. And it's very important to filter it through what God's word has to say according to the message that you're receiving. He who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man will receive a righteous man's reward. Isn't that what we want? You want some reward? You want rewards in heaven? Jesus said, lay up treasures in heaven. Invest in heaven. It's okay. I'm kind of greedy in that way. I want to invest as much as I can in heaven. When I get there, I don't want to be riding around on a tricycle. I want to be riding around on a big motorcycle, right? I want to invest because when I get there, whatever I've got, it's going to be for eternity. So we got this little blink in time we call life. And we invest in heaven during this blink of time. And that's, that speaks of where we're going to be in the Lord forever. There's no second chances. You got one shot. And uh, verse 42 Whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, Surely I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. There are those who are thirsty. There are those who are in need. And it's so easy for us to put our blinders on and walk past them like they're not there. We drive by them every day. Maybe we live next door to them, but we see them everywhere. And most of the time we shun them. We say, you know, they ought to get their act together and go make you know, useful life out of themselves. But you know, some of them can't. Some of them need you and me to give them a cup of water, to give them a little mercy. And when we do that, we do that in the name of Jesus. And you might be changing somebody's eternal destiny just by reaching out to them and doing something kind in the name of the Lord. So I want to encourage you this morning. Why don't we go ahead and have you guys come on up. Worship team, please. A lot of stuff here this morning that we've gone through and looked at together, and I hope it's not information overload. I hope you'll be able to glean something you can walk out of here with this morning and make it applicable in your everyday life. And once again, if you're here and you need prayer, please stay for a minute after church, or even while they're doing these two songs, you can get up and go on over there and visit with Lonnie and and Chris and maybe pray with them. Share your heart. I know it's a humbling thing to do, but it's necessary. It's necessary for us to to get back on track again. Is is the fire in you just kind of barely flickering this morning? Are you having a hard time keeping it lit? I would encourage you, get some prayer. Get that fire going again inside you. Light that fire again, amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. And and, and today you've truly shown us where the battle lines are being drawn. You've truly shown us this morning the difference between light and, and darkness and right and wrong. The path that you would have us to walk with you. Lord, you told us you would never leave us. You will never forsake us. And this morning, Lord, we cling to those words because so many of us are going through these difficulties right now. And we're so thankful to you, Lord, that you're right there with us, that your spirit dwells within us, and that we have hope, that we serve a risen Messiah, a risen living Savior. Lord, implant these things in our hearts and in our minds. We want to serve you. We want to please you. We want to be the light of the world. And Holy Spirit, we just pray that you continue 
to, to put us in the image of your son, Jesus. And we thank you. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. the morning
Come and stand before your Maker, wonderful of fear. Come behold His power and glory, yet with confidence draw near. For the One who holds the heavens and commands the stars above is the God who bends to bless us with an unrelenting love. Rejoice, come and lift your hands and raise your voice. He is worthy of our praise. Rejoice, sing of mercies of your King and with promise the beloved of the Lord one with everlasting kindness but with sacrificial blood bringing reconciliation to a world that longs to know the affections of a father who will never let them go This path before us, he is walking with us still, turning tragedy to triumph, turning agony to praise. There is blessing in the battle, so take heart and stand amazed. Rejoice when you cry to him, he hears your Wipe away your tears, rejoice. In the midst of suffering, he will help you sing. Rejoice, when you cry to him, he hears your voice. He is worthy of our praise. of your King and with trembling rejoice. Amen. Lord, we do rejoice in what you've done for us, Lord, in the sacrifice that you've made on our behalf. Lord, we just want to devote each and every day to you. And Lord, just be a shine, a light for you that shines for everyone to see, Lord. We love you so much, and we love all the blessings that you've given us, Lord, and we want to be a blessing to you each and every day. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Have a blessed week, everyone.